So there's no way these messages will get through while I'm here in this cabin. It's pretty remote, even though I'm really only about 15 miles outside of the University of Colorado, the Boulder campus. So I'll send them when I leave. The man who once owned this place was named Sebastian Conran. He was a professor at the college about 15 years ago, English lit. He published the occasional story, one novel no one ever read, put out by some other university's press. They say he was always a little odd, kind of funny, but kind of dark, a bit of a hermit. But then he changed for the far worse one summer in 2005. He he went into this cabin where he had been living for a while, two days after the spring semester ended and no one ever saw him again, except for two people, two people who had passed themselves off as students, but not students of Conran's, uh, um, a man and a woman, both about 20. No one ever knew their names. They were just seen with Conran more and more as the spring semester went on, uh, talking with him very intently, sometimes overheard debating philosophy, semantics, religion. Everyone assumed they were students because they were almost always on campus. There are no photographs of them in existence. It's all mostly hearsay. A hippie couple, some people said. Some people described them as a goth couple, dark-haired, talking to no one, no one but Conrad himself. Where they came from and where they ultimately went, no one knows. Conrad only had two neighbors back then. I could see one of the houses through the trees from the east window, but the other one is, is gone. The eastern neighbor reported that these two young people showed up on foot at Conrad's house in June, and they essentially seemed to move in. It was thought they were here for about three weeks. And then one day they were seen walking down the road that I came down to get here, which leads toward town. And then they vanished. It's also not known at what exact point Sebastian Conran disappeared, but he never showed up for his planning meetings for the fall semester. I am now sitting in his cabin among the things he left behind. They're all still here because he owned this place and he left very specific instructions behind about its maintenance. It wasn't hard to get access, I just had to write to his executors, some law firm in town, and ask to see his archives. The only stipulation is that I can't take anything with me when I leave tonight and I can't photograph or copy anything. In his uh, normal life, Conran wasn't terribly prolific. His uh, colleagues said he would write three or four stories a year. But during the summer, he was visited by his young friends out here in this fairly nice cabin. He became so prolific, it, it stretches the imagination to conceive of it. He dated all of his works of that time very carefully. And all those works seem to begin as soon as the man and woman left here. It's what he wrote that no one has ever come close to being able to explain. I'm holding in my hands right now, right now, as I leave this message, a crudely bound manuscript, one of many, many on the shelves. This one is 307 single-spaced typed pages. The title of this novel is A Rhyme to Ward Him Away. And this professor, who mainly wrote fiction about uh, class strife or the lives of the urban poor, produced in 2005 this novelization of the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. What is seen is not always what is real. According to Shakespeare, there was something operating in nature, perhaps inside human nature itself that was rotten, a canker, as he put it. 
Now, of course, Hamlet's response to this and to his mother's lies was to continually probe and dig, just like the grave diggers, always trying to get beneath the surface. The same is true in a different way in Julius Caesar. She selected a student who rose anemically and faced the class. Uh, he began. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell. The graves stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets as stars with chains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun, and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost a doomsday with eclipse. Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. Chapter One She was thrown from somewhere and into a long corridor with a big white glow at her back. She could see the bent silver of her shadow in front of her but distorted, arched and clipped like the bending bones of her. And she realized as she started to run that the floor was wet and the water gulped the light, swallowed it like a rained on road. Her bare feet slapped. The hall resembled the halls of a school, and she kept thinking in the smoothed-over grooves in the concrete blocks were the start of them, the tall slatted panels in ordered rows. But it was a trick, and they dissolved. She moved toward the other end of the hall, and she knew in a way what was ahead, but she couldn't stop herself. She couldn't choose that, and she was running into it, and that something terrible was coming. And no matter where she was, it would find her. Still, she needed to keep moving. She could feel herself ridiculous in her stupid ribbon gown, trying to move her legs. But it's like the air was thick. She felt her muscles and nerves vying to seize up. And she tried to pick her legs up through invisible mud. It was a pathetic running a candy version of running, and her arms flailed uselessly off her shoulders like a doll's. Before her, and behind, and all around, a low voice started, and she stopped and looked back into the pale glow, which had shrunk in size and was now a doorway, and she thought she saw something there, and she froze. Then she heard a scream, like an animal slaughtered, a bleat pulled like sick taffy out in strings, and she spun around again to see a sheep stumble panicked into the hall, hooves slipping and clattering out from a doorway to the wet cement, and behind it and all around, the voice, which was soft, took the scream and rode the end of the scream and laughed high and wild and fast in an unholy glee. She darted to the side and into a tangled city of pipes and tanks. And she ducked around and under hissing, escaping steam. And the metal gray catwalks hurt her feet. She grabbed the clammy side rails. Her eyes darted around corners of valves and tightening wheels like the helms of ships. Boiler. Was that where she was? The word brought up Kitchens and gray meat, wet and stringy, and margarine from the bread or frozen peas pooling and diluting in puddles beneath it, and her scraping fork over the thin of it, the cheap glass tap of it, with green designs ringing the plates, and they suctioned into each other in their cupboard stack, and the smell of Ajax and dish sponges and the smashed-in fists of steel wool shoved in a frog's orangey mouth. Her mind ticked off terms hysterically. Turbine. Recovery. Firebox. She looked for a way through. A whistle kept rising, and she couldn't place it until she could. And then she knew he was here, that he was everywhere. 
and the burst of steam next to and over her tried to burn her arms, and she ducked sideways and around, and there were great tanks and rusting amber pipes and spools for chain and hose, and the water from leaks came down in drips and rivulets and streams. And somewhere there was straw and filthy wool and burlap and some sheets hanging down and moving and billowing from the fire and steam like prairie laundry and wind. And she glimpsed a machine bench and a tarp and saw the shadow and saw it ripped through. She ran again through the invisible mud. She couldn't tell whose breath was gasping, pulling forward and out. And she spun around to face whatever was coming. She screamed with everything in her, everything left to scream. And it came so high and full, it turned into the whistle and scrape of the animal screams, and she watched movement of the shadows where she'd turned and knew something was being killed out there. The hot, dry air of a fire pit licked her back and warmed her. She moved her raw feet forward once again, slowly, and by a steel ladder he rose up from the floor like a sick, burned, bursting toy. But she wouldn't die tonight. She would have to wait for that. In her cold sweats and crosses. In her shredded gowns. So, in all, there are 14 novelizations of horror movies sitting here in this cabin. None of them were ever sent anywhere. They were just typed messily, uh, bound here in Conrin's home, and left behind. I've been reading from this one or that one for a few hours now. There's no evidence, none at all, either here in the cabin or in the words of the people who knew him, that Sebastian Conrin even liked horror movies. But this stuff is his last written testament. It's all very strange. You should be the one here instead of me, since I'm so poorly versed in horror cinema, but I do know just enough from pop culture to know that most of these novelizations veer way off the source material. I picked up his version of Psycho and found that he had Janet Lee's character, the one from the shower scene, survive that attack and play dead and come after Norman Bates later on in the story. Suffice it to say that Conran's version is twice as violent as the movie and that no one survives in this one. Norman Bates kills them all. It's called The Desert Willow. My estimate is that there are 4,500 pages of these novelizations here in the cabin. The longest one is 480 pages. That one is based on a movie called An American Werewolf in London. And uh, the shortest is the one I'm holding now. Like all the others, it seems to be a first draft. It's just born from a sick burst of creativity. He very much wanted people to come out here and read them, obviously, uh, which is why he set up this business with his executors, but he never left any statement about his purpose. There's just nothing here uh, but these books and the ones he owned, lots of stuff about history and sociology and linguistics. The only scary book he owned was Frankenstein, and the only one about movies was a collection of Pauline Kael's essays. Mostly he just seemed to recreate the imagery of these movies in his own way, wallowing in it. Uh, maybe trying to redefine it? I don't know. Novelizations, I guess, are maybe the least respected literary genre. Uh, but the way he approached them, there's something more here. It, it makes you imagine uh, what might have been. Sometimes he begins them with extensive epigraphs from literature and film. Like with this one. 
The boy raised the Bible and tore out a page with his teeth and began grinding it in his mouth, his eyes burning. Shepard reached across the table and knocked the book out of his hand. Leave the table, he said coldly. Johnson swallowed what was in his mouth. His eyes widened as if a vision of splendor were opening up before him. I've eaten it, he breathed. I've eaten it like Ezekiel, and it was honey to my mouth. Leave this table, Shepard said. His hands were clenched behind his plate. I've eaten it, the boy cried. Wonder transformed his face. I've eaten it like Ezekiel, and I don't want none of your food after it, nor no more ever. Flannery O'Connor, the lame shall enter first. Half an ear cocked, something in me, all night, every night, is waiting for you to come home. Lionel Shriver, we need to talk about Kevin. It felt like being suspended in water, the falling. The fishbowl tumbled first, catching beams from the windows on the way. Then the gold, tear-shaped cigars of the animals skating out in all directions in the broken spill. She hitched onto the balusters with all the grip in her fingers, and she tried humiliatingly to pull a leg up, to hook her heel over the skinny lip of the second floor, but she couldn't, and she called to her son because he was there. Because he was there and it was his fault. Because he was there and he wanted this, she was sure and she felt her hands grow slick with her panicked sweat. He was just inches away. His little head pushed out to the wooden bulbs, carved and painted white, and he was pink-cheeked and calm as milk. Dark hair curled around his face, setting it like a jewel stone, and the color of his eyes with the shocking blue of sea glass. He didn't shout for staff, for help or reach, just watched her coldly, bemusedly, as her grip was forced to part by her fist sliding down over the wider, graceful curves. She saw him so clearly in those moments. He was an alien to her, and she was angry, afraid. As this was an aberration for a mother, for a decent human being, she knew she would not be believed, would not be listened to, and would have to come to peace with her death on the heel of those consequences. Later that night, immobilized, on a pain drip, she drifted. Visions passed through. She let them rise and let their air out and sink. She stacked them in towers of blocks, the regency and ease of their home, which was moving down along the small creek. And the dream was that every time she returned, she would have to find it. The building itself was moving ever closer to water and submerging in the soaked ground. And she was soon having to claw into it to clear a manual path to an upstairs window, which she tugged open and had to belly in. The thick black dog that had come somehow to live inside. It hung at the perimeters of rooms where they slept. She spotted drops and smears of its wet drool at the door frames and along her son's baby trains. The party where her world began to split. The temp carnival on their green lawns. Cake and smiles and chemical smelling balloons and dark tapestries of light coats and cameras and careful shoes and big sugary glasses of steam. Crashing, delirium, clutching the sun so tight to her body that he couldn't turn his head back to see. The euphoria from the roof. The screams and windows breaking like waves. When her husband came in, he was so familiar that he almost wasn't. He looked different to her now. But she supposed he had for a while. He had pulled 
and just carelessly was his most likely color. Some sort of change up with her, and she wasn't sure of the start. Maybe the night he first asked her about their son's health. Isn't it a little strange, he had said. I mean, no measles or mumps or chicken pox. Not even a cough or a cold. I just think it's a little unusual. This had sounded strange to her, but maybe only because she hadn't considered it. She downplayed, soothed him, soothed herself. Justified, she realized now. But after that, this burden had switched to hers. That talk had, if not planted something in her chest, given her a wispy permission to admit what she was already seeing. And she knew now, with every certainty, that he had lied to her. Something disingenuous had passed between them. It was probably something he thought would leave, would lead to good. But whatever it was, it was weak and it didn't protect her at all. In fact, the whole kingdom, if it was a kingdom he wanted, was now thinned out, indeterminate, bruised, wide open to thieves. What was the quote? I'll tell you, folks, all politics is applesauce. She opened her eyes to his. Don't let him kill me, she said. It was the one thing she asked, and as soon as she did, she knew he would fail her. Bless him, but he would fail. He couldn't help her now. She leaned back into space and would sleep as long as she could. I never saw uh, The Omen, but in flipping through this book, it was that name I would spot sometimes, Damien, that made it clear to me what the book was about. Conran didn't even seem to care if the movies he adapted had originally been novels. That didn't seem to matter to him. Clearly, he wrote from the screen, not the original source material. People stopped looking for him fairly quickly, I think. His young friends, too, whoever they were. But they seem to have done something to his mind during their brief stay in the cabin. Something very profound. I'm not authorized to spend a single night here. I was supposed to have the key back a half hour ago, actually. So I'll be moving on here very shortly. It's not easy just disappearing. But Sebastian Conran did. In 2017, a body was found at a drive-in just outside Barstow, California. So badly burned, it was unidentifiable. Self-immolation, right there in front of the giant screen out in the desert. The DNA showed it was Sebastian Conran. He must have done it when no one else was around. Anyway, I just want to finish reading this one little part, this uh, one little part from one of the only movies he adapted that I've actually seen. I saw it when I was a kid on TV. I'll never forget it. An old black and white thing with uh, Robert Mitchum. I can't remember the name of it for some reason. It will just not come to me. But it spooked me pretty bad back then. Um, and now these these pages, typos and all, have kind of brought it back again. I can almost feel it. So yeah, I'll send these messages out soon. You know, it, it occurs to me that as difficult as the cell phone has made it on writers of horror movies in terms of suspense, now that everyone can call for help so freely, what will it be like for them in you know, 15, 20 years when we'll all be able to make a call from anywhere on earth, every forest, every dark road, every isolated house. I feel for them. 
it's kind of sad. They ran. They ran. They ran up the cellar stairs and out of the house. The yard had never seemed so large. It seemed to stretch forever like a baseball field. They ran along the river until they could see the boat and the rope tied to a knotted tree. John could feel Pearl's hand clutch and jerk and slip in his, and he tried not to pull her off her feet, but she was so much smaller and she didn't seem to understand what was happening. Though he was often impatient with Pearl, her whining and her short legs and her hungry eyes, and what he frequently and meanly thought of as her slow mind, he would protect her until he couldn't anymore, until his arms failed, until the monster caught them and ripped him apart like cloth. They could hear the monster gaining, closing in, flashing and flailing through the brush. They stepped down into the dark, down the drop to the riverbank. Pearl clutched her doll in her free arm. Children! Children! His words were clipped and economical, almost subverbal, like staccato beats of sounds. The preacher grabbed and bared his teeth and sliced and tore as he ripped down after them. The doll. Now that was death, John realized. That's what brought death to their home. That's what brought him. And he took their mother and made her desperate, made her dead. Though she thought she was alive, but she was alive and running on fumes. And she wasn't their mother anymore. Her body had no time for anything but him, his scripture and his fires. She was gone, and the monster had come and ate the light. John hated the way Pearl looked at him, the monster. John wanted to shake her until she woke up, until she cared about her little life again, until she stopped craving his love and looked away. But Pearl, at her age, in her skin was all id. Later on, when she was grown, maybe she could try to detangle what all this had done to her. But she would probably be alone inside that, and it might kill her anyway. She'd sooner blaze than sleepwalk in her cottons and eat roast. And John thought that there might be people who want to be like that, stuffed with money, their organs removed or shoved to the side. They would lie awake at night, feeling the soft crackle and crunch of their paper soles. Maybe it's as corroding and exciting as they say, he thought, holding a secret. We all want the world inside of us. When the preacher hit the bank, there was a brief, unholy pause. He stood for a second to his full height, and the moment was stretched out, filled to bursting with him in the moonlight, in his black suit and ribbon tie against the bone-white shirt. The round cage of his chest pushed out, and he fell to his knees in the sucking mud. As the boat slid off, so agonizingly soft and slow, he struggled and reached and sank waist-deep in the clay. And even full sunk and splashing, he held the knife always raised up out of the water and glinting in his pale, big-knuckled fist where the fingers bore L-O-V-E. As the boat pulled away and was taken up by the little hands of the river, the water babies may be down there mewling for beads. It took them out and delivered the cargo of them to the deeper creatures of the middle current. And the preacher stopped, half sunk, and stared. He looked like something drowned. Drug up, shocked, and belly white, and naked like a furless thing, save his eyes, which were changed, and like a dog's. Wretched and raw. Unseemly. Embarrassing. And a deep hurt was there. He made a sound. It started in his chest and moved up his throat and finally reached his mouth and took his lungs. It was an 
animal cry, both splitting the night and powerless against it. And it faded and folded into the cold breath of stars and the hay mounds of distant square farms. John had collapsed exhausted against one of the crossboard benches and gulped a sleep that his body knew wouldn't be long but took it hungrily. Pearl stroked the hair of her doll, money pushing out beneath its apron like entrails and falling over the damp boards. The boat drifted slowly under the moon, along the storybook trees, and the planets burned above them in celestial schools. Spider webs glinted, radioactive silks. The boat drifted magically unmoored between spiking aisles. The spiders were there and the toads who perched on rocks and trees and gulped out their throats and their round ear pits, taking them in as they trickled by. Fish clogged and twisted quietly in their lair pools and welcomed them along. Hares sniffed with their constant alarm the tall, tacky grasses, their tacky milks, and ran back from hawks to their holes. Cattails loosed hordes of mantis and moth in the waltzing air. Dust burst reflected on the tiny water of clouds. As they floated, drunk with sleep, awaiting landing, the preacher took to his horse and set out across the roads and gullies and fields of the land. Being a monster, a myth of nightmares, He didn't need food or rest. Just the skittering sheep and the judging owls and the chittering foxes in their dens. Stroking the hair on the braids of her money-stuffed doll, Pearl, carefully and with great sad fortune, began to sing.